Hello and welcome to learning about the Great Depression in Brazil. This is a PowerPoint that I've remixed from Donald Davis. Uh, he's at the George Washington High School in Chicago. Just gave him a little credit here at the start. Now, here are the key questions that you are going to pursue in this presentation. Uh, you want to know what ISI means, mystery acronym. In general, you want to know uh, what effect did the Great Depression have on Latin American countries? We're going to focus on Brazil. If you'd like to find more information, it's available in your textbook. You want to know how much did Vargas change the economy of Brazil? And then you're going to be able to compare and contrast the policies of Roosevelt and Vargas in terms of um, their effects on the economy and what their plans were. And I think it's also interesting to compare the political systems of the two countries, just like we did with the US and Canada. Let us begin with a map as we should always do. Uh, Brazil is that giant country in green, that big old green country. Now, what you don't see in this political map is the terrain of Brazil, and it is immensely varied. It's a lot like the United States in that it's got um, this early settled coastline, and then it pushed west over time. And so some of the heavily settled areas would be around Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, Salvador, um, and in those areas, those were the wealthier areas, the larger cities, and where a lot of the power, political power, was concentrated. In general, Latin America was hit very hard by the Depression, but responded in political ways that were very different to the U.S. and Canada. Before World War I, Latin American nations were not particularly industrialized, but because they experienced uh, World War One as a, a cutting off from the rest of the world, they then used some of that time to industrialize themselves. And that was mostly textile production. So it wasn't to the level that we will see during the Great Depression and into World War Two. So here's some key impacts. World War One impacted Brazil because coffee was the main way that they made money from exporting stuff. During World War I, there was growing demand for that coffee, which seems great. Uh, and in fact, by 1915, there was a boom in Brazil. However, after, you have a problem. Because after the war, those destroyed countries that are no longer borrowing money to keep their economy afloat, um, then the coffee demand goes down. But Brazil recovers relatively well, and they actually used a lot of the profits from coffee to help create more industry. As a result, there was more urbanization and industrialization, and it started to change the whole society of Brazil itself, as you begin to see urban industrial workers forming a totally different set of political groups. Um, and they also became far more diverse ethnically and racially, uh, and there were immigrants coming from overseas. It was, it was almost like Brazil had some of the features that the United States had in the late 1800s. And there's even a lot of interesting cultural elements that come out of this, like the diversity that gave birth to samba, the style of music, and also dance. Here are the key products of agriculture in the 1920s. They primarily, and coffee is by far the largest one, but also sugar and cotton. And in the past, sugar had been the major uh, item produced, particularly in the time period wherein Brazil uh, extensively used slavery. Food production... <laughs> which this feels like it's an embarrassing thing to have happen to you as a country, but it's also just a result of free trade, that food wasn't a highly efficient or money-making thing to produce in Brazil, and so they didn't produce a lot of it there and had to import a huge amount of food. So they were exporting coffee and importing food, but while coffee was uh, priced highly, uh, that's actually a pretty good deal. If we look at what city life was like at the time, this is about how much workers earned, and this is about how long they worked. <laughs> And that's about how many days a week they worked. And here's the gender imbalance, which, um, depending on who you ask, still exists. Okay, here's ISI, that mystery acronym that I mentioned at the beginning. Import Substitution Industrialization is what it stands for. And it's the idea that, okay, we're not a very industrialized country, said Brazil to itself early on. And what we need to do is we need to get more industrialized. So we would, here's an idea, let us tax all those foreign finished goods coming in like furniture and cars and planes and junk, let's tax them, put a tariff on them, and we'll use that money to build up our own industry so we have enough tax money to then put towards supporting those industries. And it protects our new industries because 
uh, they can actually make planes that will compete price-wise with those taxed items from overseas. And in general, this is a government, heavily government-involved set of policies, which is very against uh, what was happening in the United States in the 1920s and even before that with laissez-faire economics. Most Latin American nations from the 1930s until the 1980s adopted some form of import substitution industrialization. And in general, it is attributed to the impact of the Great Depression because these Latin American countries, which mostly exported uh, natural resources and primary products like uh, agricultural goods, um, they imported basically everything that wasn't that. And because the prices of that, the prices of those uh, primary goods declined significantly in the Great Depression, they had to do something. And so like, well, let's build up our own industry. Maybe that'll be good. And once they started building up that domestic production, they actually changed the whole shape of all of their economy. So it didn't start out as necessarily a grand vision. Uh, it was more just a practical choice of how to solve the depression. And lots of countries put these protective tariffs up, but in Latin American countries, it actually provided them a unique opportunity to build up their own industry because they were just primary product producers. And Lots of these populist governments, uh, meaning using the policies that would be popular with a great many people to get elected and then putting them into place, even if they aren't very supportable or sustainable, um, they almost looked a little bit like fascism in Italy and in the Soviet Union. So they sort of drew on the right and the left, which is why we put populist as separate from either you know, far right governments or far left governments. But all of those groups, fascists, communists, and populists, used state-induced industrialization, as in using state money and power to force more industrialization in your country as a response to the free trade that had kind of got them stuck in just producing primary stuff. And overall, there is this key idea called positivism. And it's the idea that science is the ultimate decider, arbiter, of truth. And Vargas, our fellow down here that we're going to focus on today, saw industrialization, especially, you know, steel production and other things um, that were part of this grand reimagining of how humans could live, like in giant cities with skyscrapers, uh, as connected or even parallel, synonymous with progress. And so he, because of his views, placed a priority on import substitution industrialization, which is one of the reasons that he was chosen as the president to be put in power by the military. We'll get to that in a second. In Latin America, ISI was often accompanied by changes in government. So there were lots of old governments that were primarily ruled by those who controlled those primary resource production. Uh, they were neo-colonial governments, and they were replaced by somewhat democratic governments, which sounds good. Uh, semi. Emphasis on semi. The banks, utilities, and other foreign-owned companies were taken, either from the people who, from Brazil who owned them or the foreigners who owned them, and then either given to local business people or were made part of the government or nationalized. Here's the man himself. This is Gutio Vargas. I apologize if I mispronounced it. I don't speak Portuguese, and I'm here doing my best. He was dictator of Brazil from 1930 until 1945. You'll notice that is the very end of World War II. Uh, from basically the beginning of the Depression to the end of World War II. So he's kind of like an FDR figure. They're, they're parallel in the years uh, that they are in power. And then after a brief stint outside of power, he comes back and doesn't do as well um, and commits suicide in 1954. And here's his nickname in Portuguese. And here's what it means, the father of the poor, because he was seen as a person supporting uh, policies to help workers. So that makes him sound great. But let's get into a little bit of what, um, how Brazil's economy changed and what actually were the results of his policies. Between the two world wars, Brazil was changing very, very quickly as a result of import substitution industrialization, as a result of all the money that came in from World War I. And in a lot of ways, it was seen as, again, similar to the United States, as a potential world power. But they had a very different political system that strongly resisted change and industrialization, and urbanization, and all of the interests of a new middle class, because those very, very wealthy people had concentrated all the power in their own hands, and they were able to resist useful and important changes in the country. 
Here's a layout of Brazil. Notice uh, these are borders where other countries would be. And here's the Atlantic Ocean out here. Here are the major uh, regions within Brazil. So all of the political and economic forces in Brazil come to a head in 1930 because the previous president, Julio Prestes, uh, had basically indicated that another person from his party and closely connected to his policies, which many in Brazil saw as ineffective in response to the economic crisis, um, that, he was gonna, that Washington Louis was going to be elected. However, uh, there was another challenger on the horizon, who we already know gets involved in the whole thing, Gutillo Vargas. And Vargas's policies were far more popular, but Luis did win. But a bloodless coup, meaning that the threat of force was at least used to kick out Washington. So Vargas's liberal alliance was a collection of the urban middle class and uh, this group, the Tenentes, uh, career military officers, who overall the middle class and these military officers, who were also in terms of economics in the middle class region, were annoyed, frustrated with all of these elite high class people who owned the coffee and cattle businesses uh, controlling the government time after time. So Vargas lost again, but the election outcome was claimed to be fraudulent. Uh, and that was often true in the period of 1889 through 1930. That's the old republic. Uh, that's just after the end of slavery, 1889. Brazil had slavery very, very late. Um, the military, in contrast to the United States, is traditionally very active in Brazilian politics. And that's actually true in many Latin American countries. And they decided to install Vargas, the runner-up, as the, quote, provisional president, while they sort of figured out how to reconfigure the whole political system. Uh, but Vargas was just going to kind of stay in power the whole time. So like Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the United States, uh, Vargas focused on economic policies, particularly throwing money at uh, in an attempt to stimulate the economy. And here it says a state interventionist policy. That means the state intervening or getting involved in the economy. And they used tax breaks and import quotas, meaning that you cannot import any more than this amount, so that local businesses would be able to expand the amount that they are making and expect to make a profit. And in general, Vargas used the uh, ideas of nationalism, this devotion to one's country and what's good for the country, and connected that right into his pro-industrial policies. So he would advocate heavy tariffs like, hey, let's put taxes on those other guys' goods, and then let's make our own goods. Here's a quote from him. Perfect our, perfect our manufacturers to the point where it will become unpatriotic to feed or clothe ourselves with imported goods. So definitely using that nationalism to his advantage there. Here's another key idea, the coffee valorization program. That was something that all of those previous, the previous government made up of those elite people who owned coffee plantations. Um, they created entire sections of the government devoted to managing the price of coffee uh, which then would act as a safety net in case the price of coffee suddenly plummeted. The problem was uh, the Great Depression just blew that whole system apart. Uh, Vargas attempted to bring it back because it was a popular policy because of how many people were wrapped up in the coffee trade business, and it was Brazil's main um, export at the time. And so he used a bunch of more extreme policies than had even been used in the past, like restricting how much you could plant, like purchasing up all of the extras, like just straight burning extra coffee. And they also used it to um, help uh, like put in the asphalt for roads, which I thought was really interesting. Um, I don't think it would have smelled like coffee, but I, I like to imagine that. And the coffee industry it didn't seem to help all that much, but it actually, they used it for other agricultural goods that um, seem to do better. So here are some key parallels, not between Brazil and the United States, but between other new fascist countries like Italy and later Germany. Um, Vargas created a, worked on creating a new constitution in 1934 and drew on some of the seemingly successful ideas of fascist countries in Europe. And here are the key points of why he did that, because he's really a populist leader, but with some fascist bits. For instance, he really focused on stimulating industrial growth and 
this is the more fascist bit, suppressing the communist influence in the country as a way of maintaining power um, and out of fear of communism's influence. The Brazilian constitution established a new body called the Chamber of Deputies that specifically placed government authority over the entire economy. And these import substitution industrialization methods um, did manage to improve local economies and reduce foreign dependency and was very appealing to nationalists in the country. And Vargas had sort of a mixed record on labor rights. So for example, uh, it ex there were expanded social programs in the new constitution and there was a new minimum wage, which didn't exist before, but sort of like what happened in uh, other fascist countries, like, sure, you get these nice things, but on the other side, you actually get less power as a labor union or as a group of workers in terms of organizing yourself. So there's strict limits on labor organi organizing and strikes. Look at how much industrial production increased, doubled over the course of five years. And the United States during the time was still struggling with the whole depression thing. And Brazil then was sort of uniquely positioned to recover from this then. And in 1940, there was a five-year plan announced, which again is very much like what you see in communist countries or in fascist countries, with the specific goal of expanding heavy industries and the railroad system. And that set up a series of uh, nationally controlled companies to manage that whole thing. And the whole goal here was to both be self-sufficient, Brazil going it on their own, and aiming towards a kind of total government, especially dictator control over the economy and society. He's also seen as, because he's seen as the father of the poor, he's also seen as connecting these poor people to actual governance, like expanding the electorate so women get to vote. And there's also social security and uh, legalizing labor unions, but placing strong restrictions on them. Um, he, on the other hand, very actively crushed dissent and made it so that labor unions became part of the government more than um, antagonists to it. And then what we're going to see during World War II is that Brazil actually jumps in on the side of the allies, even though uh, in terms of how they were running their government, it was far more fascist or even sort of like not communist. They were very explicitly not communist, but sort of fascist in nature. Uh, so I hope this was helpful to you. I look forward to hearing what you've learned in class.